least among the least. I don't say that to be humble, I'm being honest. The Lord can use me, he can use anybody. Uh, Johnny, I'm going to get you and uh, Sean will go back and lock the door so nobody can, can get out, right? But uh, it's always a, um, um, an honor uh, to, to, to preach here behind this pulpit because I know the gospel that's gone out from this place in the last 48 years. Uh, let's open your Bible tonight to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, we're going to read from there and then find your place over to Hebrews chapter number 4. That, that, that will be later. But for right now, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Lord never ceases to amaze me. Some of the things that Brother Tony taught this morning and some of the things that uh, Pastor Lawson preached this morning uh, ties right in with what the Lord had laid on my heart. Uh, so 1 first, first Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? Why, why would they say that? Well, look over there in verse number 33 of the previous chapter. He just took a sword and hewed up Agag. Uh, so he's got a little bit of a reputation he's built up. So he comes in and they want to know, have you, uh, have you come peaceably? Verse 5. And he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The message will come from verse number 7. And I want to talk about this thought tonight. The eyes of man compared to the eyes of the Lord. Verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Look at your Bible. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. I'm thankful for that. Amen. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. My Father, I pray you'd hide me tonight behind the cross. Lord, I pray you would use me in a way that would be pleasing to you. Give me sweet liberty as I try to bring this thought in Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to do a contrast between the eyes of man and the eyes of the Lord. And there's quite a contrast there. Proverbs 15, 3, you know, when I was little, my dad used this on me and Sharon. Probably one of the first verses I was forced to, to, to remember. My dad used this on it because Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. <laughs> and uh, he would make us quote that. What was Proverbs 15? The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, Dad, beholding the evil and the good. And I tell you, it's hard to go out and get in a lot of sin when you have that pounded into your head all the time. But the eyes of the Lord, the Bible said in Proverbs, are everywhere, every place, beholding the evil and the good. In Psalm 66, 7, it says, the eyes of the Lord behold the nations. And rest assured, he beholds the nations tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse number 12 said, the eyes of the Lord are forever on the land of Israel. They're there. And in Job 34, 21, he said, the eyes of the Lord or upon the ways of man. Now look in Hebrews chapter number four, and I want you to see a correlation here between the eyes of the Lord and the word of God that you hold in your hand. Hebrews chapter number four, verse, verse number 12, for the word of God is quick, it's alive and powerful, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Not so much worried about the flesh, it's the heart that he looks at. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. My, what a thing. Do you see a correlation here between the eyes of the Lord and the word of God that you hold in your hand? Amen. Could it be that the word of the Lord is the eyes, the word of God is the eyes of the Lord? Because the Bible said it is a discerner of the intents of the heart. That David said in Psalms 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. So you find, you find that the eyes of the Lord and the word that you hold in your hand strips away all of the veneer, looks past the flesh, and looks straight into the heart. My, it's a discerner. And Pastor said a couple of weeks ago that he, he's a critic. He's a, he critiques what's in the heart. He knows what's in our heart tonight. He knows a part of us tonight that nobody else knows. Now that can be a sobering thought if you think about it. He knows a part of every single one of us tonight that nobody else in this building knows. Oh man, he knows our ways. He knows our motives. He knows our secrets. Thank God he knows our burdens and our sorrows. I don't know if any of y'all remember this or not, but when I, years ago, not that I'm that old now, but I mean, uh, when I pastored my first church, me and Shannon took the young people up to Christus Gardens. It's not there anymore. How many, how many even remembers Christus Garden? You remember that up there in Gatlinburg? And a lot of these kids had never seen that before. And so we took them up there. And uh, it's, it's amazing. There's, there's a sculptor, artist uh, uh, rendition of what they think the face of the Lord looks like. And let me tell you, they all get it wrong. <laughs> None of them gets it right, according to Song of Solomon. But they, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture of the face of the Lord and the hair and all of that. And, and the eyes. How many, how many knows what I'm talking about? You've been up there. No matter where you go, those eyes follow you. And so a lot of these kids had never, teens had never seen that before. And so they would move over here and watch the eyes of the Lord in that marble follow them. Yeah. And my, that, that made for some good preaching to them later that night because they, 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 they got a picture of the eyes of the Lord. And the eyes of the Lord does, does not look upon the flesh like the eyes of man, but the eyes of the Lord looks past the flesh Knows what your motive is, knows what my motive is, knows what makes me tick, and knows what kind of spirit is inside me. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That, that is the kind of holiness that we come before when we come before the Lord that can look straight into our heart. In Luke chapter number 18, a rich, Luke calls him a, a rich ruler. Matthew 19 adds the fact that he's young. You know, that don't hurt nothing. But this rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18 comes to the Lord and he said, good master. Now listen to this. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if I'd been one of the disciples looking at this rich young ruler through the eyes of man, I'd have thought, huh. What do you think, James? I think that boy right there would make a pretty good candidate for discipleship, don't you? Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, he's young. He's rich. That don't hurt. <laughs> and he's already a ruler. You know that boy right there putting his, his influence and money into this ministry? <laughs> hey, I, we could definitely eat better. Wouldn't you have felt that way if you'd been one of the disciples? He's a rich young ruler. But there's a word that he used that bothered the Lord. But see, because he could look past the regal robes and look into his heart. And if he's young and he's rich and he's a ruler, most likely he inherited his riches. Most likely he inherited 
his rulership from a father or a grandfather. His question to the Lord is this. Hey, I want to get in on the ground floor of this ministry you got going and this eternal life thing. I'm all over that. What, what can I do to inherit? You see the word? Inherit eternal life. And the Lord looked at him with eyes that fire that burned straight into his soul and saw his motive. Lord knew what was in his heart. He said, in essence, my ministry is not about money, it's about serving. Sell all that you've got. Sell all that you've got and give it to the poor and pick up a cross and follow me. You may get your robes dirty. And the Bible said that he walked away very sorrowful because he had many riches. You see the difference? You see the difference in the eyes of man and the eyes of the Lord? There's a huge contrast there. And you come to John chapter number 8. You know it. You've heard it in there. The woman taken in adultery. These, these Pharisees and scribes, I, I think I pastored some of those guys a few years ago. They brought this poor woman and her shame before the Lord and shoved her down at his feet. The problem they made, they brought her to the friend of sinners. And they shove her down at the feet of Jesus and they make their accusations and said she was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses said she should be stoned. And the Bible said this they said trying to trap him. They're not going to trap the one that wrote the book, man. Yeah, I mean, you've got to be smarter than that. And the Bible said that he just knelt down and he began to write. And when he looked back up, would you like to look into those eyes? Not me. He raised up and he looked at them and he said, those of you without sin cast the first stone. Would you want to look into eyes like that and then pick up a stone to, to cast at this woman? And the Bible said they dropped their stones and they walked away. See, listen to me. If I've learned anything in my time in the ministry, I've learned this. He can look past the painted face of the harlot. He can look past the reddened eyes of the drunkard. And he can look past the needle marks of the addict. And he looks at the heart. Yeah, I can't do that. You can't do that. But he can look straight into the soul and see the heart. And this poor lady in her shame there and he said, woman, where are those thine accusers? She said, Lord, there are none. He said, neither. See, he saw something they didn't see. Maybe she was just a little misguided lamb. Maybe she had been raised in the home or the house of harlotry. And that's all she knew. They couldn't see that part. They just saw a woman, according to the law of Moses, that they felt like should have been stoned to death. Aren't you glad? <laughs> wow. Aren't you glad? My goodness. The world may look at you and think you're just not worth it. They may look at you and think there is absolutely no hope for you. They may look at you and say, well, they just got too much baggage. Aren't you glad tonight that there's a God in heaven that can look past the sin, past the flesh, and into your heart? He's not concerned as much as why you do a certain thing or what you do, but why you do it. Judas was not a thief because he stole. He stole because he was a thief. See, the problem is a heart problem. It's what's inside here that man can't see. That's what he's concerned with. My, 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 my. Oh, my goodness. The eyes of man, they're going to condemn you. You can rest assured of that. Uh, for some people, you'll never be good enough. You'll, you'll, you'll never measure up uh, to some people. You need to get over that and get past it. There's only one set of eyes you ever need to worry about, and that's the eyes of the Lord. He looks into the soul. Boy, let that, let that settle in to know that somebody can look at me tonight, look straight into my soul and know what my motive for being up here is. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? 
knows every secret that's in my heart. Knows things about me that no man on the face of this earth knows. Wow, what a thing. Isn't that something? That's something, isn't it? That's something. You get to Matthew chapter 1. I think Tony, meant, Brother, Brother Lawson mentioned it. You, find, you have the earthly lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that earthly lineage, there's four women that's mentioned. Four, four women that's mentioned in there. Of those four, one of them was an ex-harlot. The other was an ex-pagan worshiper. Are you kidding me, preacher? Really? We're not all blue bloods? No. That's what was in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you remember when Joshua was sent to, sent to spies into Jericho? And he saw, the Holy Spirit led them to the house of a harlot. Are you kidding me, preacher? I'm talking about a friend of sinners, man. There's not so much concern with what you do, but why you do it. And so Rahab hides the spies, lets them down by a scarlet, a scarlet cord, and she makes Joshua give her a promise. I know your God has given you this land. We've seen what he's already done. We know about the Red Sea. We know all that your God has done. When you come into the land to take it and he's gonna give it to you, spare me and my family. And Joshua said, you stay behind that scarlet cord and that'll mark your house. You stay, and he was a man of his word. Do you know that he brought Rahab back into the camp of Israel? And she met Salmon, which was a prince in Israel? And she, whoo, are you kidding me? Don't you know that when they brought Rahab back into the camp of Israel, some of them started running her mouth? You don't think people do that in church, do you? Surely you don't think that. Yeah. I'm sure that she never lived down her past in the eyes of some of them. They looked at her as just a filthy piece of trash that was nothing more than the spoils of war. Yeah. But <laughs> amazing thing, the eyes of the Lord looked at Rahab the harlot in Jericho and saw the great, great grandmother of King David. Amen. Wow. Man, that's almost a, enough to call a 20-second timeout and shout for a while. The eyes of man never saw that. They never saw that in Rahab. Oh, my goodness. And then one day, they, they had a young one, you know. You know, Rahab and, 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 and Salmon, they, they had a boy. I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but his name was Boaz. You remember Boaz? Well, one day Boaz goes out to check his field. And uh, he sees uh, this young lady gleaning in his fields he'd never seen before. And uh, every young man in here understands what Boaz, uh, Boaz said, who's that? Yeah, get your head up, boys. Make time to pray. Wow, who's that? And if they'd been a good Baptist standing beside him, they'd have said something like, oh, <laughs> yeah, her. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. You want to know about her? <laughs> well, that's that pagan worshiping girl that came back with Naomi from Moab, God's wash pot. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what she was in the eyes of man. The Moabites hated is and they hated the Moabites and was told to not intermarry with the Moabites. She came back with Naomi. She said, whether you go, I'm going. Your people's going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. But what did the people see in Ruth? Doesn't matter. Because the Lord saw the great grandmother of King David. <laughs> Isn't that something? Isn't that, that, don't that help you? It helps an old filthy sinner like me. It does. To know that in the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ, there was an ex harlot and an ex pagan worshiper. Because he saw something in them that nobody else saw. Wow. In Luke chapter number 23, Jesus is dying on the cross. In Isaiah chapter 52, said he had been beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable. He was marred, his visage was marred more than, the sun, more than any man. Isaiah 53 said that there was no pleasure to look upon him. He was beaten to a bloody mess. 
Now watch this. He's hanging on a middle cross. There's a thief on each side of him. One of them was untouched, a perfect picture of the world. But the other one had been listening. And I'm sure he heard when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I had a guy to tell me one time, he said, he really believed this, preacher. He said, you know, that thief could not have been saved because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I said, man, don't lay on the side of your head tonight. Your brain will run out your ear. He was hanging beside the word of God. And the word of God was affixed to the top of the cross in three different languages. Oh, yeah. Now, you put yourself in the, in the place of this thief. Here's a man that's been beat beyond recognition. And you say, Lord. And he turns on that cross. And he looks at you with those swollen, busted, bloody eyes. Yeah, you think about that. And looked right straight into the heart of that thief and said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. Amen. That's the difference in the eyes of man and the eyes of the Lord. My, my, my. When I got down to this part, part I said, I said, Lord, if you don't want me to go any farther than that, I'll start right there. We'll, we'll, we'll do an invitation, and I'll call the dogs off, hunts over. Depends on how much liberty that, that I had, and, and you've given me a tremendous amount of liberty. Somebody asked me one time, how do you remember all those stories from all those years? I tell you, I've done something many years ago early in my ministry that my daddy told me to do. Everything that happened in my ministry or, and dealing with people, if it's something that I wanted to remember... I would go home immediately and I would write it down. I'm glad I did that then because now I can't remember where I was at yesterday. But I came across this and had me a series of mini spells. I was pastor in Union Chapel and driving a tractor trailer for Food Line. And we, we wore nice little pressed uniforms. I mean, we, we looked like Smurfs. They were they, they, they were they were dark blue pants and, and a blue shirt about like the one Chris has got on back there, had the American flag on the side, had her name on it. I mean, you 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 was you was dressed well, you didn't have to touch no freight. All they paid you to do was drive. Just get it to the store and go get a cup of coffee, wait till they get it unloaded. And and I had had a long day that day. John, you may understand. I went through the Vale of Tears, man. I started in Wise, Virginia, up through Pound, Virginia, Norton, Virginia, back around the Gate City through Kingsport. Oh, my goodness. And I was wore to a frazzle. Give me just a few minutes. I don't like to tell stories, but the Lord laid this on my heart so strong tonight. I was, I just, I wanted to get home. It was in the fall, the early winter, where it starts to get dark by 5.30. And so I was just, I got on 81, headed to the house, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do this. I, I, I need something to kind of, uh, you know, wake me up a little bit. I've had a long day. Started early this morning, so I was going to stop at a particular truck stop up there that I stopped at a lot. We didn't have to buy fuel, but they had good coffee. If you bought fuel, the coffee was free, but uh, they liked us, and so if you had a uniform on, you, you, you could, you know, usually get free coffee. And I was just going to... I even let the truck, I was going to pull in there, let, lock it down, let it idle, go in there, get me a cup of coffee, come back out, get my truck, and go to the house. And so I pulled up there, popped the brakes, and I'm sitting there for a minute, starting to get dark, and I seen two little old girls. They knocked on the door of the truck beside me. God is my witness. I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I know what they are. You know what they are. Let me see them through your eyes. Lord, let me see them the way you would see them. And so I got out of the truck. As soon as I started walking toward the truck stop, here they come. Two beautiful little old girls. Hey, mister. Would you like to have a date? I said, no, sweetheart, I wouldn't. But I said, I've got something here I'd like for you to read. 
and I gave her a gospel tract. And she looked at me and she said, uh, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yes, honey, I'm a preacher. She said, preacher, I didn't mean no disrespect. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean any disrespect. Our, our uncle is a, is a preacher. He's a preacher in Ohio. And, 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 and I said, look, girls, listen to me a minute. I said, what you're doing is very dangerous. I said, you can get hurt out here. And I said, worse than that, I said, you're going to lose your life doing what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And you could die doing that. You know what she said? She looked at me and she said, we don't want to do this. We don't want to do this, preacher. We don't want to do this. I said, why are you doing it? And she went over to her sister and she moved her hair back. And they tried to cover up her black eye with the makeup. And she said, Sissy's brother, uh, Sissy's boyfriend beat her up and told her that if he catches her, he'll kill her. And said, Preacher, we're just doing what we got to do to get back home to Cincinnati. And it's almost like the Lord said, Ask them how much the bus ticket is. Oh, I mean, yeah. I said, and this was, this was the acid test to see if she was lying to me or not. I said, how much is a bus ticket back to Cincinnati? She opened her little clutch or purse and right there it was, buddy. I mean down to the penny. This is what the bus ticket will cost to get us back to Cincinnati. And the Lord said, I'll let you borrow my eyes. And I'll let you borrow my heart. Now let me borrow your bill full. And I said, come on, girls. Boy, you should have seen the rest of them truck drivers. And me walking across that parking lot with them two beautiful little old young girls. We went in the truck stop. I went up to the fuel desk. And I said, ma'am, I, I said, uh, would you, could you do me a favor? And she said, what do you want? She said, you know these girls? I said, no, ma'am, I don't. But I know somebody that does. I said, uh, they got the money they need for their bus trip to Cincinnati. I said, would you see to it that they get a cab or, or get to the bus station? And she looked at me like, she said, I'll make sure they get to the bus station. I said, thank you. And I hugged them. Boy, you're talking about something if it had made it back to Clinton? Yeah, we seen a food landing driver up there hugging around on too. Yeah, I, you think I cared? I hugged them two girls. They cried with me. <laughs> Promised me that as soon as they got home, they was going to get back in church and get right with the Lord. They pro both of them, pro and I believed them. I believed them. I couldn't look into their heart. But your eyes is a window of the heart, isn't it? And boy, I'm telling you, tears are just pouring out of their, their little old eyes. And, 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 and I hugged them. They, they went in there and sat down. I got in the truck, prayed all the way home, all the way back. I prayed, oh, God, oh, God, help them to do what they said they was going to do. Lord, please help them. I got home and realized I didn't have no money to eat on the next day. Boy, right here, I'll let you know whether or not you got a good marriage. I told Shannon, I said, I, I'm going to need some money to eat on tomorrow. She said, what would you do with all your money? I said, I gave it to two little prostitutes at the truck stop. <laughs> She's listening right now, and she was here. She would nod her little head and said, that's exactly what he told me. Yeah, I said, I gave it to two little prostitutes at the truck stop up on 81. <laughs> You gotta have a strong marriage to do that. You gotta have a wife that trusts you to do that. About two weeks later, I came back through there and, and I went in and would you believe it? It's hard to believe, but that same woman was working the fuel desk, same one. And I walked up to her and I said, ma'am, she said, she had a smile this time anyway. She said, oh, you. And I said, what about those girls? She said, uh, I gave them something to eat and told them to save their money. Told them to save the cab money. 
When I got off, I took them to the bus stop. And I stayed there with them till they got on the bus. <laughs> How do you think most people looked at those two little girls at that truck stop? How do you think they looked at How do you think the eyes of man looked at them? Some of the eyes of man was looking at them very lustfully. Absolutely. But it just so happened that I asked the Lord, let me borrow your eyes. I know what they are. You know what they are. But let me see them through your eyes. And be able to approach them with your heart. And look what the Lord done. Look what he done. Look what he done. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just about through. I am. I, right here I had a little note with a little thing about it. I, and it says, if, the, if you had a liberty to get this far, do this. So I will. And when he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy and not as I am. <laughs> Man, you got it. Let me tell you something about your pastor of 48 years. He don't like to be bragged on, but let me tell you a little bit about him, but maybe you don't know. You know where he started his ministry? I'm going to ask him just come to the instruments and get ready to play something softly. Just come get ready to play something. You know where he started his ministry? At the rescue mission. Going to the outcast. Going to society's throwaways. Yeah. Going up there with my dad and taking the gospel to some, to some that, that you wouldn't even want to, you wouldn't even want to look at them. Despicable, stinking in their own, in their own filth. And he took the gospel to them. Nobody could see him up there. Why do you think he done that? What do you think encouraged his... Can I tell you what encouraged him to do it? Because in 1973, he bowed his head. <laughs> and he looked into eyes that he'd never looked into before. Amen. Amen! He looked into the eyes of one that looked straight into his soul. Amen, 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 and amen. Listen to me. Tonight, it's eyes of mercy and forgiveness. You turn away from those eyes. You're going to be looking at eyes of fire, wrath, and judgment, Revelation 19, 12. You're going to be looking into eyes of fire. Tonight, tonight, as they play softly, you can come. You can come to one that's not going to condemn you. He won't condone your sin but he won't condemn you. He'll see something in you that nobody else can see. How do you know that? Because I'm preaching me. He saw something in me that nobody else could see. I'd got some bad people run from me. They didn't want to associate with me. Even guys that I went to high school with, played ball with, didn't want nothing to do with me anymore. I had a scar right here where a whiskey bottle went into my throat. If it went farther and cut my juggler vein, I would have bled out. Had a hole in the side of my car from a 357 Magnum. Scars in the back of my head from a dog chain. <laughs> Sitting in a bedroom one night. And I looked up and I said, Lord, I can't live for you, but I can't live without you. I don't know where to go. I don't know if there's any good left. And I can tell you this, and I'll stand before him one day for what I'm preaching. I heard a still, small voice that saw something in me that I didn't know was there that looked past all the trash and the garbage and saw something that man couldn't see 
Isn't that something? And I stand before you tonight, not because I deserve it, because I'm accepted in the beloved. Because when I was at the very end of my road and didn't want to, didn't want to go any farther, I didn't want to go any farther, he came to me. He came to me. And he saw something in me that I didn't know was there. I love him with all of my soul tonight. Just bow your head just for a minute. I'm through. I'm done. Look, I'm closing my Bible. When a preacher closes his Bible, he can't preach no more. I'm through. Just close your eyes just for a little while tonight. And do something. If you've got an honest heart, say, search me, O Lord. Search my heart. Know my heart today, my Father. Search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Is there anything in there, Lord, you see that, that needs to be changed? Lord, if you find something in there that needs to be changed, please, please, give me the strength, give me the courage to step out of my seat and come to the altar. You'll not find condemnation here. You'll not find a God up here with a club to beat you to death. He'll accept you tonight with open arms. You don't know where I've been. I don't care where you've been. Preacher, you know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. And neither does he. He's concerned with why. Why. He wants to take care of the why tonight. Not the what or the where. Would you just be honest with him tonight? I've done all he's asked me to do. I can't go no farther. I'm done. It's up to the moving of the blessed Holy Spirit of God. And if the Holy Spirit's not tugging at your heart, don't you dare move. But if you feel a tug of the Holy One, you better move. As the preacher said this morning, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. The door of this dispensation of grace is starting to close. God bless you. Thank you for your attention.